Hello and welcome back, and that is right, today I want to talk about the myths in network attached storage. I've been doing this gig for a while, and I actually look at the comments, I don't respond to every single one of them because I'm only bloody human, but I look at the comments, and do you know what? Time and time again, I see certain statements, certain declarations that, frankly, in 2024, are at best myths, and at worst, just not on. So in this video, I'm going to tackle eight of the most common myths I see in the comment section about the world of network attached storage. Let's go. NAS drives cost more. This one, I'm kind of surprised, is still around in 2024. Nice and simple, that NAS drives cost more than normal drives, and the whole thing's a big con. Now, on the face of it, there's actually an element of truth to that. Whenever you look online, you look at 1TB, 4TB, 6TB, wherever, you will find that NAS hard drives actually do cost more than normal hard drives. They're very rarely the same price, and generally you find somewhere between 10 to 15% more for a NAS hard drive than a normal hard drive. So does that give weight to this myth? No, because although the basic tenets of that sentence is true, it should be highlighted that for what you are getting for your money and keyword value, I'll say right now, NAS drives gives you a lot for when you purchase them, notwithstanding that these are drives that are geared towards 24-7 use, regardless of what you think. On top of that, it should be said that NAS hard drives have a tendency to arrive with a few bells and whistles that are very specific to NAS. Number one, higher durability. A lot of them, the workload rating can range from 180 to 300 to 550 terabytes written per year. It's something that on domestic drives is just not the case. On top of that, Warranty periods. Warranty periods on NAS drives start at three years and go up to five years. General desktop single-use drives are almost always two years warranty. And then you look at some NAS brands uh, like Seagate who have got their own range of, say, Barracuda PC desktop drives and have their Iron Wolf NAS series of drives. And the NAS series of drives not only include all of the bells and whistles we've covered, but they also include data recovery services, something you don't find on the bulk of singular use drives. So yes, on the face of it, NAS hard drives do actually cost more. But there is more to that argument than just, I hate seagulls, than just assuming that they, they cost more because it's a big con. There's actually value built into those drives. Synology lock you out of third-party drives. Much like my earlier point about utilizing domestic class drives versus NAS hard drives, Synology are not strictly locking users out of third-party drives. Don't get me wrong, I'm not in love with the way they're approaching compatibility and support right now on their platform, reducing the number of drives on their compatibility lists. That is not the same as locking out of drive use entirely. What do we mean by that? Well, if you choose to use your Synology NAS of choice, and particularly one that was released after about 2021, 2022, you'll find that unless you use one of the seven or eight WD drives, the nine or 10 Seagate drives, and about 15 to 20 different Toshiba drives on that system, as, or one of Synology's own hard drives, the result is that you use a third party drive like the latest 2022, 20, 24TB drive, and the system says, this drive isn't on our compatibility list, we recommend you use one of the ones on there, or continue at your own peril. That's a reword of what's there, but it's basically the gist. The point is, you can use those other drives. And I have checked lots of them, and so have others. And there are lots of drives out there you can use on the Synology NAS platform. It just means that one, occasionally the system is going to give you a little notification that says you are using drives that are not on the compatibility list, which depending on if you are the seller or installer of this product may prove problematic. But on top of that, in the highly, highly, highly unlikely event that those drives lead to the system breaking, then that may invalidate the warranty that Synology are providing with you because the warranty is intrinsically linked with their presentation of they say the system can do X, Y, Z as long as you use it within X, Y, Z parameter and using the drives that aren't within that remit are outside of that. But the statistical likelihood of the hard drive being the thing that takes out the system OS, takes out the system MOBO, CPU or into our operational PSU is phenomenally small and Synology have made it clear that unless utilizing that third party drive actually caused the issue then it's not going to affect you long term it's just going to affect the support and it underlines or at least invalidates I should say 
the promises they uh, what they say this system can do if you're using it in a non-supported configuration it doesn't lock you out of using those drives it merely changes the support you have to fully populate a NAS this is one I hear slightly less, but definitely still exists. And that is that when you buy a two, a four, a six, an eight bay NAS or whatever, that you should fully populate it on day one. One of the biggest arguments people make for that is one, that you are buying all the drives at once and therefore they're all sort of last in the same amount of time. And two, that you are maximizing the performance, which you are in a RAID configuration. However, you can run NAS systems on as little as a single drive if you choose and if you are going to go for a larger configurated system again 6 8 or even 12 bay system i would argue it's actually better sometimes to partially populate it 50 percent 78 percent of it and leave the other bays empty therefore it gives you the ability to add drives later you can also leverage the spend you're going to do on a device when for example you populate a device with 10 tbs and you know you are specking this system to last five to ten years why are you filling to, uh, say, 100 terabytes of capacity if your data growth is 10 TB per annum? You don't have to do that. You could get ahead and just populate it with 40 to 50 terabytes of space, and then as your budget allows, start adding more drives. On top of that, you can ensure then that you know what are the old drives that may over time need retirement and the newer drives that don't. If you buy them all at the same time, you're gonna to have to retire them all at the same time if you are off that mindset. So yes, I don't agree that you have to fully populate on day one, and in some cases, it's actually better for you. A NAS without internet access cannot be compromised externally. Now this one is something of a misnomer. A lot of users choose to have their NAS completely offline, completely disconnected from internet services because they are convinced that by doing that, they have closed the doors on security vulnerabilities from outside of the system. And to a point, they are mostly right. However, if you are setting up a NAS on a local area network, you are doing it because you intend to store data on it. You intend to back up, you intend to share data on it, whatever. The point is that you are still having devices on the local area network, the LAN, connected to this. And all it takes is one device to be compromised. And I bet some of those devices are internet connected there. So don't assume that a NAS that has no internet connectivity is completely unattackable remotely because if it takes a macbook if it takes a windows pc if it takes a mobile that could be compromised with malware which will immediately then fan out and check local ips you are then leaving the door open there are more things you should do to secure your nads and removing remote access internet access etc is a great part of that but it shouldn't be the be all end all that people seem to think it is when they think just because there's no internet access they can be blase with security two-factor authentication, ensuring that users only have enough access control and right privileges, having your admin account disabled, disabling SSH. All of these are way, way more effective, I would argue, than internet access, because internet access is only as good as the pathway that that little tunnel that it opens up has access to. NAS devices with ARM-based processors are shit. Now, this is something of a way of thinking and a myth that maybe 10 years ago held some weight. NAS devices that were rocking out the gate with ARM processors, that is to say, effectively low profile processors that are consuming much, much less power, they were terrible CPUs back in the day for what we now utilize as network attached storage being as fully capable as it is. However, in 2024, NAS providers, again, pretty much the majority of them have created very very detailed operating systems that are being developed on ARM processors alongside x86 processors and that's notwithstanding that ARM based processor development has not slowed down and now you have 64 bit ARM processors that are highly capable an ARM based CPU that a lot of people would just refer to as a mobile processor is designed to take larger instructions and use compression to therefore require less 
power for those instructions to be carried out across the system. It does mean the more complex instructions that simply cannot be compressed without you know, invalidating them are not possible. Again, virtual machine deployment, some elements of transcoding and video production, but at the same time, ARM-based processors are better than they've ever been, and I've seen numerous NAS systems released in the last 18 to 24 months with ARM-based processors that genuinely quite, you can't tell the difference. And if you've got an ARM CPU that's got at least 4 gig of memory, unless you are going to use those more complex processes, in terms of file transmission, sharing, and backups, they're damn good right now. QNAP software is shit. This is another one of those statements that's thrown around online that I think lacks a bit of nuance. Now, in terms of security, as a brand, they have definitely dropped the ball a few times in the last few years. But it also has to be said that in terms of software in the world of NAS, they are very close behind Synology in terms of what their software is capable of. The client applications, applications for third-party client devices from smart home to otherwise, and the sheer range of control that their platform offers to users alongside the hardware being harnessed by that software is quite unparalleled in the marketplace and does close the gap in a number of ways with Synology. Is it as good as Synology? Hell no. Synology really do double down a lot of their investment on that software. But QNAP does give a huge range of applications and services under their belt. Where do they drop? Well, a lot of this reputation for their software being a bit pants. One, security issues that have occurred in recent years with regards to their platform being hit by security vulnerabilities, some of which affected other brands in the market, but others not. And hopefully they have learned their lesson, they doubled down on bounty programs, pen testing and more. But in terms of security, I think there is a valid argument that their platform still need to do more. And when it comes to the inconsistency of their platform, trying to do too much and not stopping the user from doing it, there's too much of that going on. And likewise, when it comes to a lot of their platform design and the UX, it does feel inconsistent at times. But I do think labeling all of their software experience as shit is just not on because in the world where we say Synology software is top dog, we have to acknowledge that at least in the remit of Turnkey Now Solutions, QNAP hold their own quite well. RAID 0 is for idiots. I'll say right now, this one regularly winds me up. I'm not a fool. I understand RAID 0 has no redundancy, and therefore, if one of those drives dies, I lose all of my data. I get it. But we all have to agree as well that RAID isn't a backup. RAID is a failover state. RAID is a safety net. RAID is buying time for in case another drive fails to stop you losing all of your data. And RAID 5 and RAID 6, which provide you with one or two disks of redundancy, are great for that. But they're not there to replace a backup. <clears throat> and when it comes to a RAID 0, a RAID 0, if you have a good backup in place, suddenly can become attractive. And particularly now we're seeing faster drive media arrive on the scene and systems that allow you to have multiple storage pools, RAID 0 does have a place as far as I'm concerned. In terms of performance, RAID 0 is one of the fastest out there. And when it comes to, um, in conjunction with an existing RAID 5 or RAID 6, say you get yourself an 8-bay NAS device, you could have six drives in a RAID 5 or RAID 6 environment, so you've got your one or two disk failover, and you can have two drives, maybe of a different media type, SATA or SSD, NVMe, in a RAID 0 to harness high performance for applications, services, VMs, containers, and more. And as long as you've got a backup in place, I still think RAID 0 has a very valid place, and calling it for idiots is just not on. 2.5 gigabit Ethernet is a waste of time. This is the one I hear the most, and it's the one that frankly annoys me the most, especially in 2024. 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, I'm not going to say is as popular as 10 GBE. Hell, I'm not going to say it's as implemented as 1 GBE. 2.5 GBE is it's a stopgap in a way. It is as the market moves forward and there are innovations happening on the controller level and the network interface level and more. Devices arriving with 2.5 GBE. When 2.5 GBE nicks, that is the little hardware component on the board at the production level, costing the same as 1 GBE is just good value. If I'm buying a product in a network attached storage in 2024 and it's got 1 GBE network interfaces, when I know 
that the system has the lane bandwidth uh, network potential and CPU resources inside to support a 2.5 gigabit NIC on there. I'm going to want that. More routers are coming out with 2.5G. More switches are coming out with 2.5G for the same reason. <clears throat> and a system that only comes out with 1GBE, I'm not thinking they should have put a 10GBE NIC on there. I know 10GBE costs more at the controller level. It requires more hardware resources internally. You'd have to up the price by 50 to 100 gig to cover production. Those all make sense to me. But saying that 2.5GBE in the in place of 10 gbe has no value is just wrong when 2.5 gbe allows you to take advantage of potential wastage on the pcie and lane allocation inside the system but moreover the fact that if the system cannot be produced affordably with 10 gbe at the very least you're able to harness a bit more bandwidth on an existing 10 gbe network thanks to auto negotiation and now 10 gbe devices start to arrive out with usb 4 support that just makes usb I'm um, sorry, uh, it allows 10 GBE connectivity to be a great deal more affordable and 2.5 GBE to continue once again leveraging the available internal bandwidth as much as possible in a way that a 1 gig NIC would have been a waste of time, a waste of bandwidth and not good value. But there you go, those are 8 myths in the world of network attached droids that I'm sick of hearing and hopefully a video like this will maybe put some of these to bed. Maybe there's ones I've not covered. Maybe you disagree with me. You know what the comments are for. I'll see you down there. But thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.